This is the second part. As I said yesterday, um, this is a lot more about the applications of graphical models. Um, and the four applications we're going to cover are a ranking system application for Xbox Live called TrueSkill, um, an application in the problem of click-through rate prediction, prediction of an, an action that the user takes on, on ads um, or on search results. Um, so this is in particular an online advertising, an application in a recommendation systems domain. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a system or the, the system that's used for recommending movies on Xbox Live. And lastly, I'll touch up on what David mentioned already, which is how can we use graphical models um, in order to help um, the task of solving, having a machine to solve the problem of Go or play the, the Chinese board game Go really well. So let's start with the true skill one. A lot of this work has been worked on over the past 10 years, so um, I definitely need to thank a lot of people here that did, did this work uh, together with myself um, over the years, in particular Tora, Tom and Phil um, in the true skill case. So the problem of true skill we're trying to solve this um, is that we, back in, that with online, online gaming, we were actually needing a system, needing a, an, the ability to find matches people that have similar skills with each other um, whenever they wanted to play online. And that need for a, for a system that assigns a number um, which corresponds to a strength in a game is actually not new. So the, the first time this problem arose was in the 60s um, when a guy called, uh, when, when, the, when the professional chess playing organization was looking for a system that helped them setting up competitions. Back then, Getting together was a quite costly act because people had to, people had to travel. So the, um, the chess community started to look into what kind of ranking systems, uh, what kind of systems could be built that estimates the playing strength of a chess player. And the system that uh, they came up with was, turns out to be a maximum likelihood estimate, was developed by a mathematician, a Hungarian mathematician. Here is this picture of him, Arpad Ilo. Um, and resultingly, the system was called ELO ranking system. So the ELO score which chess players have is basically an, um, the result of an estimation um, that is particularly focused on two-player games, games that often end in a, in a win or a loss, not a draw. But for online gaming, what we really needed was a system that can do this much faster. So ELO was designed um, for the lifetime of, the, lifetime of a chess player, lifetime skill estimate. So it takes about half a year in that system and many games for a player to be um, stably ranked. And we need an online gaming is something that even after a single match was able to assign a good enough estimate of a skill. And it should also support, ah, and it should also support um, multiple teams, multiple players per team, something that you don't have in chess. Chess is only a game of two players, but here we needed something that works for so match setups where you have an arbitrary number K um, you have an arbitrary number of teams, like let's say K, and you have a variable number of players per team. So to give you an idea what I mean, um, imagine a game of eight players, so these are their names, playing against each other. Here in this case, they only play in two teams, so the red team and the blue team. And all information we get is which of the, in which position that each team end up with. So in this case, the red team won over the blue team. Um, we know which player played in which team. Um, but the system needed to be general enough to allow for games where, let's say, eight people individually played against each other, okay? And they end up in eight different positions relative to each other. This is all based on the scores. In this case, it was a shooting game. And it can even happen that several players end up on the same score, uh, end up on the same rank because they're actually having the same score. So the mathematical question that was posed um, was, how can we find, how can we estimate the skill something that's latent, not observed, um, a skill per player, so I ranges over players, that has the semantics that if the skill of player I is better than the skill of, higher than the skill of player J, then that player is more likely to win. That's the only semantic we wanted. And why do we need that? We need it for two reasons. We need it for global ranking. People are really incented to play when, in order to rise at their, rise at their uh, excellence. And also we need it to create fair matches between players. So, when, when two players went online to very quickly find the one good match that would guarantee me a fair, shot, a fair chance of winning or losing the game. And so mathematically, what we needed to really solve is this problem of combining many, many local rankings. So one way to look at this is we have outcomes of, we have 
subset of eight players and we know there's some stochasticity in which particular order they are in, but we need to find an, a mapping to the, to the skill numbers such that we can arrange all these, so that we can consistently arrange all these local, local orderings of players that are the data that match outcome. So the way we approached this is we started with the simplest possible model, two-player game. And we started, um, as I said uh, yesterday, with a modeling question. So in, in the sampling distribution, we assume that we know the variable of interest. So suppose we know the skill of player one and the skill of player two. So in this example, my example from yesterday, let's pick EY. S1 is the skill um, of EY. S2 is, is my skill. So the simplest model that we could think of is one where we say, well, in a particular match, um, UI is going to have a performance and I'm going to have a performance. Okay? So there's a performance of, of UI is affected by his skill and the performance of myself is affected by my skill. And in which way? Well, a very simple way is to say that the performance is at another score, latent, not observed, and it's distributed around my, my skill, the blue one, and UI skill, the red one, and jointly, we're getting a joint 2D Gaussian distribution. That's the performance distribution. The skills are the means of this distribution. The variance is the parameter we fix. And now, given the performances, we, there is a probability for EY winning, and that's pretty much how, how often is the red number, the red performance, bigger than the blue, and how often is the blue number bigger than the red is the probability that uh, I will be winning. So what is this? This is basically an area under a 2D Gaussian. Okay? So formally, probability that EY wins over myself is, um, given the, given the um, performances, is just the event of P1 bigger than P2. Okay. So what we get with this is a director graphical model um, starting from observed skills to a sampling distribution on match outcomes. Now, as I said, we needed something that scales for many more situations, like more than one player per team, not just chess. So again, we went by the simplest possible extension. Imagine we have uh, four players and two teams. Um, one way that we can sort of use our existing model is that we combine the skills of the team. And one way to do that is to simply say that the performance of the team is the sum of the skill of its players, but we also have twice the uncertainty, because we have twi two, time, uh, two, two people playing or in general, n people playing, so n times the uncertainty by, uh, that everyone adds to the performance. And then we have the same sampling distribution given the performances of the two teams. We also needed to cater for situations where we had more than two teams. So how do we do that? Well, we already said we summarized the performances of the individual players per team into the performances, uh, the skills of the players in the team into the performance by an additive factor. But now we have an a, uh, observation that we can draw that has six possible outcomes. Either team one wins over team two over team three, or team one wins over team three over team two, or team two wins over team one over team three, and so forth. So all possible six combinations. In general, if we have k teams, k factorial many outcomes, the orderings, the permutations of the k teams, are a possible outcome. And the model that we chose, um, again, it's pretty simple, is in which order, if we were to run sort on t1, t2, t3, remember these are latent variables, in which order do T1, T2, T3 come out? And how likely is every possible order? So in terms of a distribution, this is, ends up being a three-dimensional Gaussian. And this is now six possible areas under the three-dimensional Gaussian. That's actually a pretty complex sampling distribution. But one thing to observe is so far we've been modeling the sampling process of our data. In reality, in training, we have that data. We do know Y. We don't know S. So what we have here is a model that, given the skills, given the things you're interested in, describes how we arrive at the data that we actually observe. The data we actually observe when an online match takes place is the index of the player, which player actually played, and what's the match outcome. Okay? So in reality, we have the situation that the skills are not observed, but the match outcome is observed, which means that this will actually factorize. We know which was the winning team, which was the second winning team, which was the third winning team. So we do know whether T1 was bigger than T2 and T2 was bigger than T3. We don't know S. Okay. So what's nice about this is when you look at the structure of this, this is a tree. right? Meaning I can pick any node and the rest of it, if I, if I kind of let loose, hangs of it like a tree. 
And the algorithm I was describing yesterday, the sum product algorithm, is an exact or approximate um, inference algorithm that works on trees because it peels away from the tree from what any node we can start on. So in order to actually come up with an algorithm, all we did is we took this graphical model, which the structure is very simple. You have the skills, variables that are latent, so you store them somewhere from a, a prior skill. Right? We convert that graphical model. If you go back, this is a directed graphical model that describes the forward flow, one model of how we actually observe, why we actually observed team one winning over team two and team two winning over T3. We went from this generative model straight to a factor graph. And the, inter the semantics is that um, it's a factor over all variables, over S1, S2, S3, S4, S4 T1, T2, T3. These are observed. Um, and we condition always, the factor always involves the variable and anything that points into it. And that was the definition of the factor graph. So turning this into a factor graph is very simple. S1 just depends on the prior, S2 on the prior, S on the prior, S4 on the prior. There is a factor that connects S1 and T1, a factor that connects the skills of the second players in the second team to the performance, um, which is a conditional Gaussian on T2 given S2, S3, and a factor that connects T3 to um, the, the skills S4, which is a conditional Gaussian as well. We also know what these factors are, because these are the threshold factors we had. These were the factors that we, we had in the example. T1 is bigger than T2, strictly, and T2 is bigger than T3. Okay, it's just a step function. So when we did that, all we need to do is run message passing. So if you look at the product of the top factors, that's the prior. If you look at the product of the bottom factors and marginalize out T1, T2, T3, we're looking at the ranking likelihood, right? And we're back to a factor graph. Think of this as a large, big black box. Data, prior, variables of interest that we do Bayesian reasoning on. But Bayesian reasoning is just sending the messages along the edges of this graph. So what that means is that in the first step of the algorithm, you send these messages because they depend on nothing. So once you have these messages, you can send the messages down to the performance factors. Once you have sent these messages, you can send the messages to the latent variables T1 to T3. And then these are approximate messages, so we keep iterating this chain down here. In practice, that's three or four iterations, and then they converge. And then you send back the messages from the data, from the performances, to the performance factors, and ultimately the product of the prior factor and the, and the messages that come from the, from the ranking gives you the posterior. And that's actually the algorithm. So if you go online, there's various implementations in, in F Sharp and Python of this algorithm that's exactly implementing what you just saw on the slide. Now, when we run this algorithm on observed match outcomes, the match outcome being who played, me, UI, or me and David and UI in, in certain combinations, um, you end up with posterior estimates. So for every player, you start with a, um, the system doesn't know what the skill is, so we have a uh, belief distribution over the skill. We do the inference, so in the posterior is probably narrower, um, it's probably shifted towards um, the, the actual skill, but there's still two decision problems to make. Remember in the first, the beginning, yesterday I said, um, the nice part about probabilistic models is they separate decision-making and inference. All I described right now was the inference. So in the decision-making, we have two decisions to make. The first one is we need to create a leaderboard. People want to see who is the best, who is the second best, the third best, the fourth best, the fifth best, and so forth. So if we do that, there is a loss we may incur. So our inference tells us what are the possible orderings of all players in the, that have registered. Um, in principle, we can work out the probability for each ordering, for each, for each ranking. But if we place a player, if we make a, a fixed assignment and say, this is the best player in the world, this is the second best, there's two types of mistakes we can make. We can either accidentally put a bad player on top of the leaderboard, or we can put a good player at the bottom of the leaderboard. And we will make mistakes. The question is, which one is more loss, which one is more costly? Which one do we think harms the validity of a leaderboard? So who thinks we should have a symmetric loss? Doesn't matter if you put a good player on top or a bad player at the bottom. Uh, actually, the other way around. A good player at the bottom, a bad player on the top. Okay, so no one thinks symmetric. Who thinks it's, it's not so bad if we put a bad player at the top of the leaderboard? Uh, well, the other possibility that good player goes to the bottom of the leaderboard, I think, 
deal with it, right? It's class 30, but okay. nobody cares, so. <laughs> I think that the, the rest of the players will, will take care of the situation pretty quickly. Basically, the problem would be rectified quite like quickly. I mean, even if you put it up there on top, then he will then be challenged against from but the loss function is not about the interact, the sort of the next step, the next actions that people take. The loss function is more, what do we value as a bad experience? Let me check last opportunity. Who, ch who thinks it's bad if we put a good player at the bottom? Sorry, yeah. So actually, what we decided for is, it's the worst thing is to put a bad player on top. And the reason, our reasoning was that most people know the top five of a sport. So most people know who's currently the top, top three in the Formula One, right? Do people know? Roughly? Top, top soccer teams, most people know top teams. Very few people know the bottom. Yeah, so it is a bad experience if you're a good player and you find yourself at the bottom of the leaderboard. But it's something that you can rectify because when you minimize the loss that is asymmetric and that values bad players on top worse than good players at the bottom, you, sh you, you see that you end up, um, the loss minimizer is actually taking a quantile of the skill distribution. Meaning, you pick the quantile, so this is, the, this is a very aggressive lower, lower quantile of the skill distribution, and now you sort every player according to this quantile. If you do that, then in expectation, you're minimizing an asymmetric loss, um, ranking loss, where bad players are Unlikely to, get, um, unlikely to get to the top. Because bad players have a small mu and, and possibly even with a large sigma, uh, even with a small sigma, they're, they're there. Good players can still make it to the top because if good players play, their mean estimate should go up. The only reason they might be low is because the uncertainty is large. Okay, so that, that's the loss function when we rank players and have to define a ranking. But there's a second problem, decision problem we have. And that problem arises whenever we need to create a match. So whenever we need to create a match, we have one player that's already online, or let's say a set of n players that are already online, and now you decide, you switch on your game console, you decide, I want to play, so you, you, you indicate to a service, I'm ready to play, find me someone. So the system has to now find, one, for one player, who is the best match in terms of what's the fairest outcome? Uh, what's the player that if we match you with, you have a fair chance of winning, and that player has a fair chance of winning. That's a completely different function, right? Because what we're kind of after in this case is we would like to know which combination of players IJ that are currently online have the property that when they play, it's very likely to end in a draw. If we, if we match you with someone that you're very likely to win against, it may feel good for you, but it definitely doesn't feel good for them. If you match you with someone that you're very likely to lose against, it doesn't feel good for you. So if we match you with someone that you're very likely to be 50% winning, it's a fair, fair chance. So the criteria that we actually chose is the probability, working out the probability that the two performances of the players are the same. Yeah? And the sufficient statistic for that is just the difference in the, in the means and the sum of the variances. And then we normalize that one by saying that the best possible match would be if people have exactly the same, same mean skill and no uncertainty. Okay? So the property of this measure, this is actually a Gaussian integral, normalized by a Gaussian integral, is it's between 0 and 1. If this is 0, it's the worst possible match. Somehow these were so far apart in combination with them that you know, it's very unlikely that the performances are the same. If the means are the same and the variances are 0, yes, that is probably you know, the best possible Fair match. Yeah. So if you do this kind of matchmaking process, then afterwards you rank the players again. Isn't this kind of weird because you kind of pollute your model because you you think your model is right, so you think players have an equal probability of winning, then you observe an outcome which under your model is completely random, and then you use this outcome to rank players again. So you kind of you see what I mean? You get this. But um, I think a question, is your question whether or not it's, it creates a feedback loop because you're creating 
the idea of you creating a training set by the combinations you, you do. Like, you, you, you run some, you do some match ranking, and then yeah. you rank again, right? And then rankings can change based on the outcome of your... That's right, yeah. So that in reality, you don't find the perfect match. In reality, the constraint is how many people are actually online at a given time. You don't want people to wait forever. So this criteria is never going to be perfect. So you're always going to gain information. And it's actually an interesting question. When we look at it as a, simply as a mathematical, as an active learning, as a machine learning problem, as an active learning problem, we could ask, forget about fairness. Which of the matches is the matches from which the system extracts the most information and expectation? Okay? Turns out that this is actually the same criterion. So what feels to be a fair match is also the match that an expectation gives the system the most bits of information. Because there's more bits when, when there's total uncertainty than if, you already, if the system already knows up front um, that that one is going to win. So we needed to test this, obviously, because um, we came up with this idea um, back in 2004. Um, but in order to test this, what we did is there was a, a beta test that was run. So this data set is publicly available now um, between employees. And they played for six weeks, um, employees at Microsoft, they played 60,000 matches. They uh, volunteered to do this in their spare time of, of three different types of games. Free for all means six players against each other. Two teams means two teams of four players or one on one is exactly like chess. They played on a map. I'll show you a video how this looks. So it's around 6,000 employees that did that, six weeks of gameplay. Um, and we took that data set, and the data set is literally in every match, which players were involved, which team were they in, and which team had how many scores from which we could work out, which was the first, the second, the third team. I should also say, I glanced over this a little bit, but when we looked for draws, um, we actually did model draws here in a very simple way. Um, remember, we had the difference of skills factor. So the performances of two teams, this is now a directed graphical model, come into the difference factor. So if we look at it as a factor graph, it ends up being this factor graph. So now depending on the match outcome, if this was a draw between these two teams, we had a very simple um, factor here, which would, if this is the, this is the, distribution over D, which is a Gaussian, we would simply say this area is draw, this area is player one wins, and this is player two wins. Okay, so we had a small margin around zero, which would constitute a draw. Um, if you're significantly above, then the first player won if you're significantly below the second player won. So, um, how, did we, how did it compare? So when we basically did the inference and then looked at the levels, we first took an Edo-like system, a system that would do effectively a maximum likelihood estimate of the same likelihood. And what you see is that the top two players, um, the blue player played 400 matches in six weeks. The other player um, actually was his son. Um, no one can play that many games and still have a full work day. Um, the second player um, played less games. And what's interesting is when you just look at the pure ranks, blue is ranking much higher than red. But per game, red seems to have made much more skill. Uh, the gradient of skill seems to have been a lot, lot larger. So we took the same data, the same which player played in which team, which team came in which position, and, and ran, the, ran the algorithm once forward through time. Um, and we ended up with this estimate. And what was interesting about this one, first of all, the order was reversed. Okay, so this, in this one, the red one was better than the blue one. Secondly, we took only about 20 games to learn that skill and then it stabilized. And we wondered, is this, what's the minimum number of games that you, that you need to play in order to learn the correct rank of a player? In order to answer this, we looked at it as, as an information theoretic game. So we said, if we have 6,000 players, how many, and there's an ordering, there's a permutation of 6,000 entities. How many bits of information do I need to communicate before I know the outcome, before I know the correct ordering? So how many bits of information do I need to communicate? If I were to enumerate all possible orderings from 
6,000 players, from 1 to 6,000. How many, how many possibilities? How big is this number? Say again? So it's log of n factorial. And log of n factorial is roughly? n log n, right? Just to see this, log of n factorial is log of 1 plus log of 2 plus log of n. Okay, so it's actually not just roughly, it's less than n log n. Upper bound each of these terms by log n. So I have n log n bits to communicate. So per player, I had n players. I have log n. I have log n games to play. Right? Because every single game gives me one bit of information. If it's a two-player game, it gives me one bit of information. So this is 6,000 players. So what's log 2 of 6,000? So log 2 of 1,000 is 10. 2,000 is 11, 4,000 is 12, so let's say it's roughly 13. So when we now look at the, um, the extra number that we needed for convergence, we see it's pretty close, it's about 20. And so we did some experiments as well, um, which showed that this, this system of inference is almost, information, almost optimal from an information theoretic sense. Because this, you cannot be lower than log n number of games per player. That's just impossible from information theory. So it's pretty fast, but still people question, is, this, is the system accurate? So what we did is we compared these two players um, over the entire six weeks. We looked at what does the system predict is the probability of the red player and the blue player winning, and what's the probability of both of them drawing? Okay? So each of these sum up to 100% at any given moment in time. So think of this as time. This is all, the 600, this is all their games where they ever played. Um, ordered by time, and then making a prediction ahead of time how likely is red to win, blue to win, and a draw. And then in the games, we saw that there was a bug in the matchmaking that these players actually did play eight times in a row against each other in one of the nights. And so we had a reasonably good point estimate around here what the chance of the red player winning is. And when we looked at that, this was the, tier, this was the moment in time when that bug happened, this guy, guy won five out of eight games. So what we saw here is really um, quite a bit of anecdotal, uh, quite a bit of confirmation that the system was reasonably accurate in predicting the actual chance of someone winning or losing over a series of a few games. So this system went live in 2005 um, for Xbox Live, and it went live in 2007 for a game, um, in particular, for a game called Halo 3. So uh, yesterday there were about five people that played this game. But for the other 100 people in the room, I have prepared a video that gives you an idea how this system used in the background is actually, um, actually used in the game Halo. So Halo is a first-person shooter. So if you start it, um, you can choose to either play a story or you can play online. Okay, so if you decide to play online, you do matchmaking. And what it does is it actually puts you straight into a thing called a lobby. So here is you, your username, your level. And now you see all these different types of games, I said, team, team games, lone games, where you play against N six players. You see the, the thing here, team sizes and, and how often. You can also see the skill distribution. At any moment in time, you see at which of the 50 levels, this is the skill, how many people are currently online. So this player was at level 35 at the time. So when you now match, you press start matchmaking, and within the next two minutes, it matches you to one of 50,000 players. And the one thing you will notice is, um, in this game, when you compare the number of ranked matches and the total XP, um, you should see a factor ratio of 1 to 2. Total XP is you get a, a point for winning, and this is the total number of games played. So it seems like everyone online um, won and lost half their games, roughly. And so the game itself, for those that haven't played it, you're playing from a first-person perspective. In this case, you have two teams, a red team and a blue team. So this guy is in the, you can see it here, in the blue team. And that's what you do. OK, so you play with all sorts of weapon. It's, quite, it's a combination of being tactical and strategic on, on, on artificial maps. Um, what really makes people come back and play millions of games a day is what you saw happening here. This is what people are after. Matches where the scores are extremely tight, 10 to 10, 11 to 11, 
Some game takes the lead, the other, game take, uh, the other team takes over. Um, and that's why people play it. This, this fairness, this ability to constantly be challenged and yet have a chance to win is what people look after. Now, everything so far was pretty anecdotal and evidence. So one thing we did is to validate this. Um, before the game actually went live, there was a beta test. And in that beta test, we, we had 1.3 million people playing and we recorded um, for every one of them if they played n games, so this is if they played one game, how many people won all the games, this is here, how many, this is one game, how many people lost that one game, how many people drew, that's uh, small. So we have uh, a bubble for the empirical ratio of winning, losing, and on the y-axis we have the current skill estimate, meaning this is the not so skilled players, this is the strongest players in the world. So what we did is we, after six weeks of the beta test, the public beta, we went and we, we measured how many people that are on level I have a winning, an empirical winning ratio of P, okay? And we wanted to see the way that the system was designed is, of course, it takes some time. I mean, if you played one game, that's random chance, right? Run game, if you just randomly toss them, half people will lose, half people will win. That's kind of easy. But if, if now as people play more and more games, some will obviously be estimated to be stronger. Will they be continued to be matched with people that they really only have a 50% chance of winning? So if I click, what will happen um, is that that video will play um, up to all the people that played to 300 games. So this narrows down. So the beginning is 1.3 million people played at least one game. In the end, it narrows down to 3,000 people. So only 3,000 of those people actually played 300 games. But at any given mo moment for n, number of games played, we'll see uh, a set of dots here. So a, a very good ranking system. What should the graph look like? The picture. A bar in the middle, right? And for a random ranking system, if I say I don't need ranking, I just match people whenever they arrive, like randomly, what would that look like? What would happen to people that are really not skilled if you match them randomly? They're losing almost all their matches. What would happen to people that are really skilled? You get a diagonal, right? So the diagonal is an element, is a, is a visualization of a non-working ranking system. A bar is a visualization of a working ranking system. So what you see now is what's happening as people play. So this is, the, this is in, in, uh, in time, um, six weeks of, of gameplay. In the way it was designed, there's a lot of design in the online experiences that it should take you at least 100 games to reach the top level. Even if you're the best player, you should have this experience of working your way up. It was actually, we actually had to do something that you, which you might find rather amusing. Um, from yesterday's lecture, we, we talked about dampening, basically making a message less informative. That's what we did. We actually heavily damped the first few games because in reality, it would only take log n games. And even with a million, log n of a million is, is um, 20. And considering that these are not one, one player games, but these are eight player games, it would take you five to 10 games. And then the system would have you down if you allowed a fast inference. So we had to um, slow it down. And what was nice is um, the reason it's not at 50, but at 45 is because we consider draws a half win and a half loss. So it shifts by five. Um, so that's why, that, what was nice to see is everything we saw before, the anecdotal evidence, showed up as large, large scale evidence. Because there wasn't a single player, this is not like some dots are omitted, there wasn't a single player in, a three, in one million players that had won more than 60% of their matches and that had lost more than 80% of their matches. So even though some people kept reporting, yes, I've lost 10 games, like, yeah, sure, a streak maybe, but statistically it's, it's almost impossible that you really lost all your games and you really won all your games. So top players had the challenge, bottom players also had a challenge and wasn't losing. The other interesting thing is we could use the system to measure the difficulty of games. What I mean by this is when you look at a game, um, like golf. So this was an online game of golf played over 18 holes. One session took about 45 to 60 minutes. So the smallest difference in your skill would actually result in one player st often winning over the other. Um, and then you look at the game like Uno. Who knows Uno? Good. So Uno, who thinks Uno is a skill game? <laughs> Good. Uno is not a skill game. Uno is a chance game. So there is, there is no, there's no skill in this. Meaning, even the best player and the worst player are no further apart than, and you should know that this is beta. Beta was the parameter of the performance variation. They're just the performance variation apart. So 
One, th one interesting thing we found here is we could take this system, we could post-mortem, after a few uh, game has been out for a few weeks, we could look at what constitutes a very hard game, one where there's many, many chains of skills, and what constitutes a, a rather chance game, by looking at the empirical distribution of skill estimates that emerge as you run it. Okay, so <clears throat> let me, before I finish the, the, the skill ranking, let me talk about one, one other application which we found rather intriguing because one thing I, I swept a bit under the carpet is how did we deal with time, evolution of skills over time? So in reality what we did is after every single match, um, the factor graph that we actually built on which we then ran forward only was one where um, if I played against uh, UI, there would be a factor that connects us to the match outcome. But then in the next match, so this is the skill of Ralph, this is the skill of UI, at time t, we would actually have a factor that would connect us for our next match. And that factor would simply say that my skill at time t plus 1 is distributed around my skill at time t with some variation. So my, my skill constantly drifts a little further, up or down. So there's dynamics in my skill. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to understand, if we use this for chess, um, can we find out if people, can we find out how the skill of players evolved over their lifetime? Meaning someone like, um, like uh, Paul Morphy or, uh, or uh, Kasparov or uh, Bobby Fischer, how has their skill evolved in their lifetime? So what we did is we built a factor graph where we had a skill of a, of a chess player at a given year of their life and then another chess player, they start playing against each other. Let's say they played a tournament, so they played several matches against each other. And then as a year passed, we created a new variable, um, the skill of, of Kasparov in the next year, the skill of, um, of uh, Kramnik in the next year. And these ones would simply be um, factors, that, factors that connect by saying there's a little bit of a drift over time. Maybe the skill went up, maybe the skill went a little down, but data in that next year will kind of be the constraint that locks it in. So what that allows us, so what this allows us, it would give us a factor graph that effectively has a connection between every player's skill in every year of their life, provided there is a chain of, of, of opponents that anyone's played with. So what that would give us is, it would give us the ability to compare players across time. Someone that played in 8050 and someone that played in 1980 or 2000, they would become comparable. They could never play in real life because they didn't live at all the same overlap. But the factor graph would have a, the graph would have a connection with them. And so we built this graph. So when you go to chessbase.com, you can actually download this data. Which players in, in the history of modern chess have played which players in the last 150 years? Um, so this is a much bigger, this was 2006, that was three and a half million games, it's even bigger now. Um, so you end up with a graph that has 20 million variables. The number of unique players is 1.2 million. Um, um, so this is, sorry, it's 200,000 active players. So if you go over the active years of everyone, you end up roughly with 1.2 million variables that are representing skills of players in their active life of their career. And you end up with about 40 million factors. So that, if you're interested in running that code on later data, this code is all available. Um, true skill through time, F sharp, um, just have a look. And it builds that graph up in a single machine memory. This is about as big as, a, you know, this, this takes about 11, you just rerun this one, takes about 11 gig of, of RAM on a single machine, runs for about 10 minutes. And what you get is, as I said, you get the ability to take the best players in every one of the first years of modern chess to the, to the current date. And you can now, in principle, I can put 200,000 players down, but that wouldn't be visible. So let's take the best player in each year, okay? What's nice is you see their lifetime profiles. Um, so what I did is, for every year, I determined who was the best player in mean skill, and then I, I included him in the time series. So this is the best of all times players. Um, but what's also nice is you don't just get the mean of the skill, you get an uncertainty. How certain, based on the data we had, is it that the skill is actually at that level, okay? So there's a couple of interesting observations. Um, one of them, if you look at the, the, this is one standard deviation. If you look at the standard deviation, it's always, almost always wider at the end than in the middle. Same here, wider 
wider, 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 wider. Why is that? Why is the uncertainty bigger at the first year of their life and at the last year of their professional career? Hmm? Mm, uh, that's not the only reason. It's part of the explanation. Between years, there is a factor too. Between years, there is. In fact, the graph was also a factor. That's right. That's the right. And, and yeah. think further. So I think you can just. Add so how many how many of these factors are in this year? Two, right? One on the next year, one on the previous year. How many factors that constrain the skill are on the first year of my life and the last year of my professional life? Only one. So the reason it's wider is because there's less constraints. One way to think about this is the constraints for the first year is really only my gameplays. And then the next year is kind of narrowing it down. But in the second year, I have the, the first year of my career and the third year of my career that are narrowing down. Think of them as springs. They're narrowing down where the skill is. The other interesting thing is um, there's a big bulge for Bobby Fischer. People know why? He was not playing, that's right. So Bobby Fischer um, did not play after a match in 1971, and then he played again 20 years later um, in 1991, one particular tournament um, against the same player that's on the chart as well, which is Spassky. Um, he won both tournaments, but he won stronger here. Um, also, what I find quite interesting, they do have um, similar profiles insofar as there's sort of an ascent to the top of their peak in Korea and then, and, and then um, a decline, except for Fischer and Spassky. You look at Spassky, he's someone that just stayed at the strong level and Fischer stayed at the strong level. Yeah? Do you also have this for these computers? We do. They're in there. They're roughly there. <laughs> my, my red dot, look, I'm going. <laughs> Seriously, Hydra is in here, it's way up. So we know that chess is obviously solved and computers played is even stronger. This is only human players in this chart. Um, good, let's go and uh, we have 45 minutes left. Let's go to the, to the next application, online advertising. <coughs> yeah? I have a question, how actually is reasonable to assume what the skill level of the player is defined by one number? Is it like a scissors paper rock game in some a good question. How, how accurate is the absolute number of skill? Actually, not accurate at all and not meaningful. Because the, when you look at the likelihood, when you look at the, the, the data distribution, the distribution, the probability of an outcome of a match. Okay? So it's the probability that player one wins over player two, or the other way around. That one is, I'm not saying what it is, I'm, another, I'm going to write the, the details, but it's a function of the difference of skills only. So skill is a relative concept. The only thing that's meaningful is the difference of skills. The own, the, in the likelihood, right? So if I take all the skills and I shift them by a thousand, then the likelihood is unaffected. The likelihood does not change if I add a constant to the skills. The only thing that locks skills to a number that is in a range the prior. Because in the prior, I say, even though, so if this, if, if all I did is maximum likelihood, then I cannot, I cannot lock down and attach an absolute meaning to the skills. If I say that I think skill skill zero is the most likely skill, a priori, then I have basically started to introduce a, a scale. Yeah. Does it make sense? Uh, it wasn't exactly my question. Oh, sorry. So uh, the question was, was like, here you assume what where is a subordering of players. Correct. Is it, like, uh, in some games where it's not like one player win an hour and then win an ah. hour. Oh, you mean one, we make an assumption? That's correct. We do make an assumption that this model is reasonable and. Uh, this model is small, and we mo make one assumption, and that allows us to actually go to this small number, which is transitivity, which means if player one is better than player two, and player two is better than player three, then we know that player one is better than player three. That's the assumption we made. And what we didn't, what you, uh, you describe is an intransitive relationship. So we make the assumption that the skills are transitive. If I beat you and you beat DY, then I will always beat DY. 
in any game, a racing game, fighting game. Not every game has this property. It's an assumption, absolutely. You can, you can fix it somewhat, um, but not fully. You can fix it by introducing more ver latent variables for all combinations of players. There's one caveat. So this is incredibly fast inference. When you think of it from an information theoretic point of view, per player, we only need log n games. Because the matrix of player-player comparison with transitivity assumed, we only need to fill in, this matrix has n squared entries. Right? If I take all the people in the room, and I say, I want to know what's the winning chance of everyone against everyone else. That's 130 squared, number of, or by two, number of, of, of uh, probabilities I need. Now, if I assume transitivity, then I can, then I own, in this matrix, I only have to fill in 130 times log 130, which is seven. So I only have to fill in seven times 130 numbers. The rest follows from transitivity. So this transitivity is actually the reason why the learning can be so fast. If you remove it and you introduce latent variables for pairings of players, for all pairings, you end up with a lot of variables to estimate and you need a lot more bits, meaning a lot more games. That's what happens, for example, in, in soccer. Like in soccer, every, every team plays every team n times, uh, twice per season, because we don't assume the transitivity there. and get a, Even if it's intransitive, you get a, a reliable estimate. So, well, I mean, this <coughs> multiple variables for, for, for the skills, not like, so that you have more than one skill per player. Oh. So then you don't have to pair up, you don't have to make all pairs, so you just, you, you could have this somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how would you come, okay. Let, we're pretty short on time, let's, let's talk afterwards. So second example I want to talk about is online advertising. Again, it's joint work with Tora, Joaquin, um, Ono, Tom, and Phil. Um, so this is examples from a, from a system that is used in Bing, from, from, some, from systems that um, are used in, 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 in Facebook and Google, like all sorts of online advertising. So what's the problem? The problem is that, um, that we're trying to solve is people go to a search, this is pretty old, screenshot go to a search engine and they type a search query. And if they type, let's say, Seattle, then we see two types of results. We see these results, and they're green, and these here in red. And there's a fundamental difference between these two results. The difference is that the green results were crawled, were found, they match the keyword, they seem most relevant. The red results are being paid for. So someone pays for Seattle flights. In fact, it's American Airlines who pays for this. And how much do they pay? They pay, this is uh, fictitious, $1.00. $2.10 and 10 cents per click. So why do they do that? Whenever they get shown, there's a chance that the, that the user will actually find this a relevant answer to the query because they were interested in getting a Seattle flight. And if Seattle flight gets clicked, then American Airlines has a person on their web page and possibly they're going to book a, book a flight. So it's a way to acquire customers and users to a page. But one thing you will notice is that um, the ordering is not proportional to the, um, to the bids that American Airlines and the other companies did. And why is that? The reason is that from, uh, from an allocation point of view, there's no value derived by showing an ad just because it pays much. The, the user that arrives will only arrive with a certain probability. So if we, what the, what the search engine has to do is it has to estimate how likely is the user actually going to click on this ad, on this ad, and on this ad? So in this case, um, the estimate were 10%, 4%, and 50%, which, is, which explains why in expectation, so in expectation, the value that American Airlines gets is not $1, it's only 10 cents. They get shown, and only in 10% of the cases, they actually get a, get a customer. So the value of showing this ad for American Airlines is 10 cents rather than a dollar, for, visit, for um, visiting Seattle is eight cents, and for the last company, Gok, is actually five cents. Now, you can already see the way that probabilities come in here is that the search engine needs to estimate those probabilities in order to allocate this space on the web page that's the sponsored, uh, sponsored site um, most efficiently. 
but it also needs it in order to charge. What would happen if you actually have Seattle flights pay one dollar per click? <laughs> Imagine you work for American Airlines. What would you do if you start paying one dollar now per click? What could you do? I'll give you a hint. Pay less. What happens if you pay less? Really? What if you pay 99 cents? So if you pay 99 cents times 10% ends up 0.99. So the search engine will still show you on top. So if you pay 90 cents, you will still be shown. What's the break-even point? What's the point at which you have no incentive to actually go lower? 80. And how did we arrive there? Yes, simply that the listening gets um, a uh, That's right. So we're basically, when we, when the, in order to not incentivize, this has actually happened in reality. So in the first search in Yahoo build, they did that and charged $1. This is like long ago, 20 years ago, or 15 years ago. Um, and then advertisers did exactly that. They were starting to go, well, why should I pay a dollar? I can get it for 90 cents, 80 cents. They were playing these games. And in order to not incent the, the advertisers to do that, you would actually say, well, what is the amount I should actually charge such that the expected value is going to be as high as the second high largest, the second highest expected value? So. If I make this a variable, how big should this be that if I multiply it by the estimated probability, I end up at the second highest bid, the second highest bid being 80 cents. So in this case, it's 80 cents. Same, same calculation here. What, how big do I need to make that charge, $1.25, in order that when I multiply it by 4%, I end up at 5%, at $5, uh, sorry, at 5 cents. So probabilities come, out, come, in, come into this in two ways. They come into it by determining where to show an ad. So we multiply um, a bit by the predicted probability and then sort. That's the way ads are shown. And they come in when we charge. And the ch for the charge, we basically say B is no longer a fixed bit, it's a variable. So how big has B got to be for this equal this? So if this has to be equal to this and you divide by P1, you end up with the charge should actually be the second highest bit times the ratio of probabilities. So if you, if you improve probability estimates, you achieve three goals with this. First, you increase user satisfaction because you actually show, show ads that people will likely click and, and, and like. Secondly, you, you make the charges fairer for the advertisers. You're not over or under charging because of bad probability estimates. And you can show that you actually increase the revenue by, by showing ads with a high click-through rate. Now, the way we, we went about this problem is it's a very structured data problem. So you show this page, in reality, when this page, you know, in reality, when you analyze this, you get this big log of which user, which, which IP, at which, um, from, at which moment in time, with which keywords has done the search. So you have these massive raw logs. And the first thing that we did is we took the logs and put it back in structured data, structured information. Everything here was a categorical variable, the, cust the user, the type of match, the keyword, the t local time of the day, um, anything, nothing was sort of a sensory data like image, rec like image data. It was all very structured and we spent a lot of time validating that all the fields are correctly populated, cleaning rows in the logs that are incorrect um, and worked a lot on the feature transformation. Because the model we chose was one of the simplest models we, we could, but was a model at the finest level of granularity. And by that I mean, it was something where, back in the days, you would, you would be doing um, a categorical feature, but encode this into a linear, in a sparse linear model, where everything but the value of the feature, so when we think, of the, when we think again of the analogy, uh, analogy of a table, we would use every single column of the table. And for every single value in a column, there would be a indicator variable in the feature vector. So given that the client IP had this value, that would now be an associated weight because you still have an, you have an inner product between a sparse feature vector that has as many bits on, as many elements on, that there are columns in the table, that there are features. Um, and then simply multiply, take the inner product, which means you just add those weights together. 
the model maintains a belief distribution over the strength or the weights or strength of the, you can think of them as strength of effects, um, which gives you a score between, that's a, a score that's either positive or negative. And depending how much is in the positive or negative, this results in a probability of click. But what's nice is you don't just get a model for a estimating the probability of click, but you get a Bayesian estimate of it. So you get a distribution over the probability of click. And this one is important in advertising because most ads, most campaigns, really only last for three to five days. Like something like the, the Valentine ads, or everything is, is temporarily bound. They, they, they work well when it's Christmas or Easter or Valentine or Mother's Day. I think Mother's Day is coming up. Um, so they're really only in for short. You have a very short time in, estima in estimating how likely is a user going to click on this ad? So you need to do the explore exploit um, very fast, in which case it helps a great deal um, if you know that something is certain to be 30%, 25% click, or that something is on average, 30% uh, is, is probably in average unlikely to be clicked, less likely than the blue one, but there's a lot of, um, a lot of uncertainty still for the higher, for the higher regime. So the graphical model um, that we actually use is one of the simplest ones. I had a small version of it yesterday, um, where we say, based on which values of which features were actually active, think of the column of uh, the table again, for every column of the table, we have a weight. The actual value determines which particular weight that is. Um, so we have a prior distribution over the weight. We simply add up the weights. This gives us a latent variable, which we call the click score. And if that click score is strictly positive, then the click is likely to happen. If it's negative, it's unlikely to happen. So we have, the, we have a transfer function, which is the probit, um, meaning the, CD, the, 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 the CDF of the Gaussian, very similar to the sigmoid. And that results in um, uh, an event, the probability of click being C. So in the prediction phase, we, we pass the messages down. So we have two Gaussian messages in our model, um, which we pass. So this factor is extremely simple. It just adds the means and the variances. Um, and this one results in, in, in the distribution over how likely is click and expectation non-click over how likely is the mean in the right or in the left part of this, uh, of this graph. And now if we observe a click, um, then obviously the mean has to shift. So the true message would be non-Gaussian. This is uh, sort of a soft version of a threshold function. Um, you can close it, solve it closed form. Um, we approximate the marginal again by the red function, a Gaussian, and then propagate back these messages. Now, what's interesting about this graph is this graph, like in, in contrast to the true scale graph, has always got the same structure. It's always like a tree, like, you know, just n branches out and one, one, narrowed, one, one path narrowed down. So what we can do is we can actually say, why don't we express the equation that is incoming message from the prior multiplied by message from the data in terms of the message from the prior. So we, on paper, you just carry out analytically the blue function as a function of mu sigma here, the blue, the, the message as a function of mu sigma here, the, this one, this one, the red one, the red one, the red one, and eventually the red one times this red one as a function of the original mu sigma. What you end up with is an algorithm that you can implement, like an, an online update algorithm, which but what you see here is the actual update equations. And these update equations are just doing, doing these six steps um, of the message passing analytically put together because the structure of the graph never changes. Now, what's super interesting about this, sometimes you, have, you find you know, um, online gradient descent algorithms derived um, with some heuristics on loss and regularizers. We didn't make any assumption here other than we have a Gaussian belief over the, skills, uh, over the, over the weights effect. And being on the positive side of a latent score means click. Being on the negative side means non-click. Now, if you look at the update equation, it's very intuitive. The mean of a weight, um, this is in case of a click, um, gets additively increased by an amount h. So what is this amount h? This amount h, let me go first to h, is this function. So this function is driven by the total amount, the total sum of all of all weights so far. So if the total amount of the total sum of the mean of the weights is positive here, then obviously a, before the click was already very likely. So not much change should happen. So H being being positive, the total amount of change is, is, is zero. If it was negative, 
and the click happened anyway, then we need to make an additive correction. In fact, if it was negative by an amount of, of minus one, we should get it back to zero, so we have to, have to add one. So when you see the asymptote of that blue curve, which ends up being this ratio, um, is actually a linear function. And now, by how much is this distributed? The, the way it's distributed across all the weights, all the different weights that are active, is that every single weight receives a fraction of this update, a fraction of the minus one update, and as much and the fraction is proportional to how uncertain is that weight. So weights that are contributing less, getting, an, getting a step size, a learning rate per dimension, which is proportional to how uncertain is the model, how little information has so far been learned. So what this algorithm actually gives is a, is a classical stochastic gradient descent algorithm, but a per, per coordinate descent, um, descent scale. And the, the amount of per, per coordinate uh, rate is actually automatically learned as a multiplicative update. Okay, so if you use an algorithm like this, um, it's actually very easy to implement. So in the material, I have, a, I have an Excel sheet that has just an Excel, the implementation of this algorithm. Um, when you apply it to ads, there's some interesting phenomenon you find. For example, if you look at the finest level of granularity for a user, so back then it was like client IP, you find some that have a very large negative value. So what I drew here for reference is the probit. So that you have a sense of minus two translates into what probability of click? Practically zero. So obviously there's a lot of, there's a, a lot of mass on people. And, and the total number of people is the, the size of the bubbles that no, almost never click. There's a, also a chance of high clickers. Do people have an idea why, why there's few people that click all the time on ads? It's an interesting story. One of the, oops, one of the reasons why there is a um, clicking so much is because of that business model, whenever you receive a click, you have to pay. So if your competitor um, receives a lot of clicks, then they have to pay for those clicks. And it's kind of a business model to ask people to click on competitors to deplete their budget because then you can win the top position because you're no longer bidding against them. So it's a good example of how, how an incentive mechanism, how a mechanism has to be designed well in order not to lead to uh, um, adversarial behavior. Um, in this case, this is obviously click, so-called click fraud because it didn't happen to any purchase and so you shouldn't charge for those clicks. Second interesting one is if you, if you actually look at the, the string of the browser that connects to the web page, you get a sense, you actually get a very strong signal on, on uh, the user clicking or not because the browser, um, particular if it's, if it's a certain browser on Linux or if it's a Linux user or Firefox users, that indicates um, how likely is that agent, that web browser, the user sitting with that web browser actually going to click. Now, one way to measure the accuracy of this um, is that it results in very accurate probability estimates for, for, uh, for the probability of click. But how do you measure that a probability estimate of a click is actually calibrated? Because I might say um, the next ad has 15.2 probability of being clicked, but then it either gets clicked or not. It doesn't get clicked with 15.2%. So how can, I, how can I check that a system that predicts probabilities is actually calibrated. One way to do that is to say that we take, you go over, a, because you have a large number of predictions, you go over a, a, um, a huge range, let's say 100 million such predictions, and you discretize this number. You just say, okay, everything that's between 0.01 and 0.02% click, predict the probability of click, is the same range. Everything between 0 0.2, 0 0.02, and 0 0.03 is the same predicted probability of click, and so forth. So you end up with 10,000 buckets, on the x-axis, and now if you have 100 million clicks, then some of these buckets are incredibly full. A lot of predictions fall in that range. And if this was happening in the past, you do know how many of those predictions were actually clicked, which is the y-axis. So what you see here is a so-called calibration plot. The x-axis is the discretized prediction that the system made on test examples. The y-axis is the empirical ratio. And in order for the i, not to jump onto totally erroneous predictions because you know two out of five examples were clicked, which you might say is 40%, but it's a very rough estimate. You make the size of the size of the dot proportional to how many predictions happened. So you can see that a lot of predictions were zero. 
Um, what's nice about such system and that has, has been repeatedly seen is they're highly calibrated, um, in particular for, for the very small probabilities as well as the very large. This is the range, that's the, this is the active range for search and advertising because you know, not, not so much interactions happens on them. Okay, you got 20 minutes left. Um, let's see. So the third application, Matchbox, that's one of a recommender system. Um, again, here's the people, David Stern, Tora, and Joaquin, um, that have worked on this. The problem that we're trying to address here is one of, of recommending, of not just doing flat prediction or sorting gamers, but recommending movies to people, okay? So traditionally, the way it's done is it's actually, we, said we, had, we look at the data, and the data is simply which person liked how much which movie. So we have this bipartite graph of a user and a movie and uh, the relevance rating between them. So if we connect them, if we collect them, we're building up a, a graph that connects users through movies. So one way to look at that is user A is connected to user D because they both um, liked, they both did not like movie two, right? Um, and so you could, you can, users and, and movies are connected. So what, allow, what does that allow us? It allows us, for example, to say, so a similar thing is true for user B and D. B has liked movie one as much as D. Um, B has not liked movie four. So if we now get a new movie, B has liked movie five a lot, and we get um, user D, will they like movie, movie, um, movie six? Um, the traditional way of doing that is looking at that graph and seeing that there was a huge overlap between row B and row D. They seem to be the similar user, um, so it's very likely. But what are we gonna do for something like movie, movie five? Movie five has never been shown to anyone, so how are we gonna recommend movie five to anyone without being, being, uh, being randomly guessing? And one idea that's been exploited lately is that while in the past we just had IDs, today we can collect a lot of meta information about this. So practically we actually know today the age, ID, what profession these people have. We know which was the director, which genre the movie was, which was the director, um, and we know meta information about it. And if we look at that one, we can now see that yes, these two people are very similar, they're both students, that's correct. And we also see that they both have an affinity for action movies. And given that um, movie five is an action movie, like movie six and movie, um, movie three, they're probably going to like that movie a lot. Okay? Now, how did we do that? We did that by using the metadata rather than simply the IDs. So let's put this, make this more formal. What's a, what's a, again, what's the simplest possible model? One model that, we've, that we looked at is to sort of say, well, there's all this information um, about a user their, their gender, their nationality. Um, let's, let's suppose that all of this has an effect um, that weights them, that puts this user onto a space that is of lower dimensionality. So let's, uh, let's suppose every user gets mapped to two coordinates by a linear projection. So this is a mapping that takes three input dimensions and maps it to two. It's a three by two matrix. We don't know what the mapping matrix is. We do the same projection for, for uh, users, uh, for items. And now we make one simple assumption that if users are close to items, then they will like them. So we have to, send, we have to define a notion of similarity. One is the inner product between these two vectors. Um, and if they're far apart, they're sort of orthogonal to each other, then they don't like them. So we get this relevance. So mathematically, what I've just shown you is the factor graph for this simple model, that R is a Gaussian conditional on S and T, and S is a projection of X by matrix U, T is a projection of the item features by matrix V. Again, like yesterday, this is mathematically the same. I find this picture a lot more in, sort of intuitive to reason about, in particular when I now want to derive an algorithm. Okay, so another way to think of this is geometrically, um, when you think of the columns uh, that we just had, we have features of the user, like uh, the ID of the user, and, uh, feature, and the gender of the user, and each of them contributes a little vector to, uh, to my positioning in a space. And the same goes for, for, uh, for the items. So the movie and the, and the director position the movie in this space. And what we intuitively want to have is that when we receive feedback, say the user likes the movie, then somehow all these embeddings, the associated vectors, 2D vectors for this and this dimension, 
should get adjusted so that the points get closer to each other. And if they don't like them, they should get further from each other. So how can we achieve this? So this is the factor graph again, where I now really represent the product factor in here. Remember from yesterday? So, so far we had the sum factor, and now we have the product factor and the sum factor again. We achieve this by simply performing message passing on this graph with the assumption that we observe a rating. Okay? So we pass the messages. We have a Gaussian belief over every element of this matrix. So the matrix is effectively fully factorizing. We send them, and these messages we can do with the alpha 1 approximation because there's exact messages. But like from this is a message we sent. So suppose we observed it's a rating of 3, the value 3 here. Um, now we have to have these orange messages because this used to be, this is the product factor. Whenever we have a, observe a product, there's these symmetries that we need to break. So here we're using a different approximation, the variational base approximation, that is for the messages that get sent in, in here. Um, then we can send back and we update every element of that matrix um, with certainty as well as position. Now, if you run this on a Netflix data um, and you simply use the IDs, so you don't use anything other than every element, every movie is represented by a one in the ID where it actually corresponds to itself and the user is the same. Um, you do get some nice geometry um, in that all the sort of artsy movies, this is all the action series, the artsy movies are here, uh, are, the, the romantic movies are here. Um, and the, the interpretation of this is if you pick a user, so a user is a blue dot, a movie is a red dot, then because of the inner product, you have this preference cone, right? So every, every movie that's in this cone is equally likely, in particular when they're like this, equally likely to be liked by that, by that, by that user. And um, the way we, we run this algorithm is, you know, our, all our past data actually starts forming just factors that we process one by one. Okay, and once we do that, we, we don't have this nice embedding you saw before. We now go back and reprocess every one of the messages again. So you, when we think of the original factor graph, we have hanging off this factor graph one observation, another one, another one. So far, we just processed the messages from the individual ratings, once from left to right. So if we now go back and refine the message, the message of the first one, by saying everyone else was, was now the refined prior, um, we start getting real geometry in this space. So what you're seeing here is the matrix, effectively the matrix uh, V. V was the matrix that embeds the, the items, um, every movie into this space. Um, and that algorithm is known as EP. It's the same one that we ran for, um, the same one that we ran for the, uh, for the true skill through time model. Now what's, what's, again, what's nice about the, the factor graph and the graphical models is they're very modular. So, so far I haven't actually told you how we modeled the, the relevance, because it's still a latent variable. We don't observe the relevance. There's three types of relevance we can observe. So one of them is we actually observe the exact rating score as a real number. If that's the case, we simply assume there's a bit of Gaussian noise, and we observe Q. OK, it's 3. That's uh, an unrealistic scenario. The, the, more, the one we took, we took here is actually one where we observed it's a, it's a rating from 1 to 5. So what does that mean? That means that we have a latent score u. We don't observe the value of it. But we know that there is threshold. And we know that 3 means that it passes the threshold for 1. It is bigger than the threshold for 2, but less than the threshold for 3, 4, and 5. OK? So that's known as the cumulative threshold model. So you, you, you simply, if you have rating data that is n star, you have n minus 1 thresholds. And then every single observation just tells the model which thresholds are exceeded, which thresholds are, are on which, for which thresholds is the, should the rating score be actually lower. Um, or, last, last possibility, if the user simply bought the movie. That's a binary feedback, which means that the score was positive or negative. We already had this example in the click case. We already had this example in the ranking case. So you need a simple factor that's a threshold, <laughs> threshold function. So if you do that, um, what you get is a, is a model um, that reminds you probably of the third slide I showed you, which is, which is kind of modular. Um, and it really separates nicely the user model, the mapping of user features into a space of users in 2D, the item model, which maps the item features into a 2D space, 
Those might then be combined with a context model that is independent of user and item, and it's an additive input. And depending on what, what sort of feedback, in this case we assume binary feedback, we have a feedback model. So this factor graph is really a modular, modular graph that we built. Um, of course, there's an equivalent algebraic expression that wouldn't fit on the slide. But, but this, this graph gives you a nice way of, of composing that view. Now, how accurate is the inference? So we compared this on the movie lens data because it's one of the few public data sets that has metadata associated with it. And the metadata is for the user what jobs they had, what age they were, what gender, and for the, for the, for the users and for the movies, what genre was the movie in. So if we use um, K, which is so far we've been looking at pictures of K equals 2, Two, two, two embedding dimensions. One thing you see is that we're actually better than, uh, it's, it's more accurate than state of the art, and metadata is always used, to two observations, metadata is, is helping in particular if we have many latent embedding dimensions. So if we have uh, more than a single dimension, um, then metadata really helps. This is just a context model. Um, secondly, if you go anywhere up to five dimensions, you're actually getting improvements beyond that the additional dimensions don't really give accuracy improvements. Second, um, second thing is if you run EP, so EP simply means, as I said before in the picture, we don't just run once from left to right through a training set, but we go back to the first example, and then we refine the message. We divide the message out and then recompute the message again, and we do it in a second. So as we do iterations, we get significantly better, but again, like in true skill, roughly after four to five iterations, um, you, you're going to go flat on the accuracy gains that you're actually getting. Okay, last example. Um, and I think here I can, I can very much uh, lean on uh, a lot of the introduction from David. Um, you can also use graphical models to learn how to play Go. Now, we didn't do this with a search algorithm. We did this more for a subset of what David talked about. In particular, in the search, we needed to know what were likely moves that the player was going to play. The game is complex. It's a game of perfect information. The reason we, the, the reason we use um, graphical models here is not so much that there is noise in the observation, but that there is computational complexity that is so large that we can never, the lack of ability to compute the solution is, is the source of uncertainty. Now, um, the kind of problem we looked at is learning to predict moves from experts. And the reason we looked at that is that back about five years ago, um, games of the last 200 years of professional players, so, so David talked about Q, 8Q, 9Q. So if you go to the next level, there is 1Dan, 2Dan, 6Dan, 8Dan, 9Dan. 9Dan is the highest, of which there's only a handful of people living playing, uh, playing that strong. Um, so <clears throat> we had games, we had access five, six years ago, um, games of 5Dan players and above became available to learn from. So meaning the entire record of every single move that a 5Dan player played against a 5Dan player, and 200,000 of them in the, whole, in the whole history were becoming available to learn from. And the goal that we had was to see, can we actually learn just by looking at the, at the situation, looking at a pattern on the board, can a machine learn to play the right move? So what that means is, if we look at this move, so this is not filled yet, so this is the opposing stones, this is, the, this is my stones, can we learn how urgent is it to play that move? And the concept behind would it be the concept that we wanted to use the model is this model of urgency, because when you play Go and uh, let's say we have a skill difference of one or two games between each other, all that all that is necessary for us to level out the game is I can make two steps, two two moves ahead of you. So if I'm seven levels below you, I place seven stones on the board and the game is even. So it's all about playing the right move at the right time. So what we wanted to do is to say, how can we predict if this is the most urgent move to play? So first of all, we need to represent that move. And one way that we felt um, that was inspired by others to represent the move is by the pattern around it. So at the, largest, at the large level, this is a pattern, meaning two above me is empty, one above me is the opponent, um, one above me to the right is empty, blah, 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 blah. This is a big pattern. Um, this is a slightly smaller pattern, smaller pattern all the way to the, to the vertex itself. So we created, in reality, we created this vector of 13 pattern sizes, and they were, there, they were a diamond shape around the move. So every move that was played by an expert, we extracted the patterns on that move, just the move, it, just the vertex itself, then the four neighbors, 
then the 18 neighbors and 16 neighbors and so forth. So that creates a, a vector of 13 pattern sizes and we said that we pick the one. Um, these are all possible vertices, all possible patterns that contributed towards the move. Now, how do we extract, um, how do we extract that move? So first of all, how do we match that, that pattern very fast? I mean, if we literally check what I just said, it will take forever to match a pattern. So how can we make a very fast pattern matching? And the trick we used here is known as Zobrist hashing. So the idea is because the board is very small in size, it's only 19 by 19, and every stone, uh, every position, every vertex can only be um, occupied by a white stone, a black stone, or empty. There's really only three values that every single one of the 19 by 19 vertices can take. So what we do is that for every possible value at every possible location on the board, we generate a, a, a random 64-bit hash. And if you do that, and then you XOR the hashes together of the pattern, meaning black, empty, 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 black, empty, empty, you XOR them together, you get a 64-bit key. And you can show that if you combine them that way, um, you, have a very, you have a very small chance, um, um, not near zero chance of collision between patterns. But what's nice about this is you can now match patterns by comparing 64-bit keys in memory. That's extremely fast. Secondly, in Go, you need to be invariant. So if I take, give you the board and I turn it by 90 degrees, nothing changes. If I give you the board and I change every white stone with a black stone, every black stone with a white stone, nothing changes. So the way we achieve this is to use the min transform, meaning that we took the board, we rotated it by 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. This is four different hashes. We took the min of the hashes. So regardless of which one of the four positions we saw, we always had the same hash key. So that way, we actually are able to extract an invariant hash and in constant time being able to match it. Now, as I said, we had access to 180,000 games. On average, these games lasted 250 moves, and we had 13 pattern sizes. So if you make the, do the math, that results in roughly 600 million patterns. Um, so back at the time, we weren't thinking about learning, learning distributed, so we n somehow needed to go back from uh, 600 million potential patterns to a pattern size that we can actually learn the urgency from. So what we did is we, um, we actually used a technique known as bloom filtering or spectral bloom filtering to count only those patterns that were played more than n times, where n was in our case three. So patterns that were played more than three times, we wanted to keep them. And by pattern, I mean we took the pattern, we rotated it in, in four different ways, we color switched it, we mirrored it. So this results in 16 different keys, we took the min of it, so every pattern was uniquely represented by a 64-bit key. Um, so we ran this with a, with a spectral bloom filter um, and, and were able to, to boil it down to 10 million patterns or so. And when you look at the distribution of the patterns over the phase of the game, by phase of the game I mean the first 30 moves, the second 30 moves, the third 30 moves, move 90 to 120 and so forth. You see that early in the game most patterns were really large patterns that survived, meaning most patterns that occurred more than three times were, were really large patterns. Because at the beginning, the board is between two players is, is almost looking the same. In the end, almost all the patterns were, were small patterns. And now, the model that we built um, was a model where of the 10 million, of the 12 million patterns that remained after the harvesting and pruning, we simply built a lookup table. And the lookup table contained a, an estimate, uh, the latent variable, was the urgency. How urgent was it for a move to be played meant how urgent was a pattern um, co um, compared to other patterns. So if we look at an expert move, so let's say this move, we would be saying, let's try to find the largest pattern, this one. Do we have the index of the largest pattern in all rotational invariant ways in the database? No, we don't. Let's make it a bit smaller. Let's make it a bit smaller. Make it a bit smaller, let's back off. Now we have it. So if we have it, we would go in, the, um, we would go in this table, table of 12 million entries, and simply look up um, what is the mean variance of the urgency estimate of this particular pattern. And the way that we learned these urgencies is simply building a graphical model with the move that was made versus all the moves that could have been made. What I mean by this is when, when you think of a board, the board has a move that was actually made that corresponds to a pattern in the database. And then there is on average 250 other moves the expert could have played instead. 
So we, looked all, we took all these patterns. And so for every single pattern, the indices 1 to n, n was usually 50, they vary over the actual patterns on the actual position in the actual game state of the, of the professional game. Um, what we wanted to know is what is the urgency for each of them. So all of them start out with an urgency of 0 plus minus 3. Um, but then we do know which move was played. So we do know one thing, which is the, if the expert is sort of a, an oracle player, we know that the correct labeling is that the urgency of this move, of the move played, was bigger than the urgency of another move that could have been done and bigger than the urgency of any of the moves that could have been done. So you, you kind of have to think of three sets of moves. The one move that was played, the 250 moves that could have been played but weren't played, and then the 11 million and so forth that weren't even available. So what this, what this, what this uh, graphical model does is it basically updates only the active moves that could have been played and combines partial rankings. But this time partial rankings only with respect to the move played and all those that could have been played. So it's, it's just lower bound constraints. Um, the move played always imposes an upper bound on all the moves that could have been played. And it combines those and learns the, and then by, by inference, updates the, the uh, urgencies of all the other patterns. And then in, in order to compare this, how accurate this was, we actually um, went through a, um, a held out set of several million games, uh, several tens of thousands of games and millions of moves. And we said, how accurate? So the move that was actually played, we called the expert move. And for every single, in every single step of the game, we said, at which rank? Meaning, was the expert move the one we predicted? Or was the expert move the second one we would have predicted if we, if we ranked it? Or was the expert move um, the, ten, in the top 10 moves that we predicted? And what you find is, first of all, the accuracy is simply just of expert move prediction was 33%. And if you went all the way to um, 20 moves, which is a huge reduction. Let's go here. It's just a huge reduction, right? Yesterday, David talked about the search tree that branches by 200 each time if you do it naively. So if you, if you constrain the search tree to 20, you're having an almost 90, with this model, you have an almost 90% chance of, of, brand, of pruning the tree to only moves that experts play at every stage of the game. Okay, so um, <clears throat> one, one interesting, uh, couple of interesting slides before I finish. Um, one thing is if you go further down, if you go further into the game, um, then the moves become much more accurate. So the, the rank error at the first move played was pretty high, uh, sorry, pretty low. So the, the first moves it really accurately predicted the opening moves. It was very good in the opening moves where there were lots of possibilities to play. But in the, in early on in the game, um, this predictive system was pretty accurate. Later on, so in the, in the mid-game and, and the finish, the quality was actually you know, much, much less than that. A lot more errors happened. When you look at in the top end, where, where is the actual expert move? The good thing there is, when you think of the Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo is something that can easily, that can easily work in the, in the end of the game because you can play to the end. You're already in the phase of the game where the end is sort of near. And so you combine, one way to combine it is to use this one, this method earlier in the game and combine it with a search later on in the game. Um, another thing you see is when you compare and condition on how big is the error compared to patterns, big patterns which are played at the beginning of the game, you're very accurate, so it learns very accurate urgencies early on in the game to play, but it gets a lot less accurate in particular towards the end of the, um, towards the, end of the game, uh, towards small patterns, just the, the thing itself um, is, is pretty much random, which is not, not surprising. Um, so to finish off, we did use that, that system in a, in a game that you can actually play on Xbox Live. So if you go on Xbox, there's a game called The Path of Go, and the 600 million patterns, boiled down to 12 million patterns, is actually used in a Monte Carlo search engine that you can play with, and in a 9x9 board, um, even on Xbox, that would play at roughly, at roughly one dan. So all of this, what you saw today, is actually um, available to play with. And with that, I want to thank you. You were saying that in the matchmaking, you to find components that are most informative. So I guess that... Um, for, for a player with large variants, it's much easier to find an opponent. Yes, that's correct.
So what do you saw is that if a person has played a lot of games, it's more difficult to find a, a game for him. That's, that's, a, that's a very good question because I did glance over this. So the, the challenge in, um, the, the biggest challenge in the matchmaking is a combination of getting an accurate match and, and creating an experience where the gamer doesn't always wait. So what we, what we do is, um, if this is time in lobby, and this is match quality threshold, So let's say that's 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. It's a bit out of scale, 60 seconds, up to a minute. Um, we start with an incredibly, we start with a very tight threshold saying, if the person only waited, we want to give him a very good match. But eventually, so this is, let's say this is, meaning you accept every match at this point. If the person waited long enough, we're just opening up that threshold. Because we, we did make an experience, there's one game, um, you can read it if you go through old blogs and, or, or versions of the internet, um, you, you find it still. In one game called uh, Project Gotham Racing 3, so this was released in 2005, and then 2006 was an update. We forgot to do this, so, so we kept it like this. So what happened is that the best players, there's actually they are renting a lot. They waited like sometimes 30 minutes to find a very good match. It was a very good match, but the person, meaning it was very tight, but waiting for 30 minutes in an online game was unacceptable. So in reality, um, the match quality is not a static number. It's not a static threshold. It's something that widens in order to make sure that this is never exceeded, um, exceeded beyond reasonable waiting time. And your best players will be matched more likely um, own, not, not necessarily, um, only if no other good player is around. But if you go up the leaderboard, there are less players at that skill level. Oh, it, yeah, yeah. The, and I, I, don't know, I don't have a good solution for it. If that's true. Um, the, the very good and the very bad players have the same phenomenon, that there's very few of them, so they're likely matched worse. But you can do nothing else than keep the game popular. In case you wonder why was I talking, this, is, this, is, this was used in, or is used in all of Xbox Live. Why was I talking about Halo? The reason we, we picked Halo was twofold. One, once we were really big fans of it, like Tor and I love playing Halo. That's, that's two years of my life where I played it every lunch for two hours. So it's true. It's, it's actually true. <laughs> um, but also, but also, it was, one, it was by far the most popular game. So this phenomenon of not having enough players was least present in a game like Halo. In a, in a game like, uh, you know, that's more niche, let's say Uno, this problem always arose, because not that many people played online. So um, I, I don't really have a solution around it. Is it possible to give handy tests to uh, the worst player? It is, it is. In some games it is, and it's something that we've been theoretically pursuing. I think so far as nothing's been um, put, into a, and put into service. But in principle, what you can do is you can imagine that what you do is, let's see if I, you just say, if I can't match a player and the, the game offers this, meaning um, the game has a chance to favor someone over another. So in a shooting game, you can, for example, remove the shield or half the shield. So, you know, the person is more like, even if it's very skilled, he's more likely to die early because he doesn't have that much protection. Or in a racing game, you just, hand, you just uh, as, a, as a matchmaking service, you change the car. You just give the faster player a slower car. Um, what you can do here is you can actually create this situation here. Imagine you have a two-player game, but you want to handicap it out. Then all you need to do is to say, well, it's still two players. S1 and S3 is still you and I. But we know, the system knows that this difference right now is so large, it would be a very bad experience. So you get, the, you get a car that's a lot faster than I get, but in sum, the total sum of your car and your skill and my car and my skill is still that T1 and T2 are equal. Um, the biggest difficulty, I think, is um, the technical, there was a couple of difficulties. One technical difficulty is um, for this one, you need to create entities, meaning artificial entities that can participate in matches but now they participate simultaneously. So before, one property was nice um, in that 
as a physical person with a physical identity, you can only be in one game at one time. So in terms of um, updates to S1 and S3, even though in parallel there were 50,000 people playing online, no person was ever playing in parallel in two matches. So when we did the update, every inference was sequential. If we put, um, if we put a car or a shield into every match, then the handicapped player is virtual. They can play in several games. So now you, you have distributed message passing, decoupled distributed message passing. So you need to um, be very careful in how you make the updates on, on the service to not get into this problem that you need to deal with dampening. The second problem was um, that it does require a very specific, it doesn't work for every game. It doesn't work for games that don't have handicaps. So it was a complexity that simply adding it to the API for developers wasn't wasn't seen as a big, big use case back then, but it's totally possible. I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that, actually, because that would make the matchmaking faster and still give very good, even experiences. <coughs> so, uh, related to the movie recommender system, uh, did you come across with this uh, scenario that when you have a completely new user and a completely new movie, and you want to predict the rating of that? Uh, 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 for the new user and the, for the new movie. Yeah. So if the user is completely new, and we, we do, we do come across this, and, it's, and the movie is completely new, and they share no metadata with other users or other movie, I don't, you can't do better than random guessing. So you do need some overlaps in the features. So if the user, for example, shares even the gender, um, it becomes predictive. If the movie shares a genre, that becomes predictive. The, the really new case is, is, is really when there is neither in the feature vector x, or I think I called them um, x and y. If, if the dimension x and the dimension in y have no overlap, then, then there is nothing that this, let's see if I can quickly jump there. If no dimension of x and no dimension of y have an overlap with anything seen before, then all the, all the rows of u and v are prior, and so all the elements of s and t will be the prior, um, we'll just have prior uncertainties. So you do rely a lot on, that's what you rely on. You rely on overlap in the values of the features between users and items. That's, that's a hidden assumption here. If that's not the case, that's why I put the IDs in here when you see the ID. The ID has the exact, the IDs, they have the property that they're unique, so they have no overlap. So this ID will never occur in any of the columns again, and this ID will never occur in any of the rows again. So they, they are not good for generalizing, but this H band will hopefully occur, and this jungler will hopefully occur. And each of them corresponds to, geogra geometrically, to little arrow. Thank you. <laughs>